Hi, and welcome to another episode of Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Tom. On today's show, a person reached out to me and said he'd love to talk with me on the show. And one of the things that I find out is their career that they have now making things started out just by wanting to do something, wanting to make something he saw and then posting it on Facebook. And then suddenly friends wanted him to make them one of those things. So he started making more. And then actually uh, kind of does an entrepreneurial thing where he's like, what else can I make? And he started making salted nuts was one of the things that he tried. And then moving on from there, making other things into shirts and uh, just getting the word out there. And also just reaching out to people because he was uh, reclaiming old barn wood and said, let me make things for you. And that kind of snowballed and snowballed. It's a fun story. So it's a great conversation. I would like to note one thing. Uh, when we first started recording the episode to do the interview, uh, we were having troubles connecting to the video feed and uh, had to start and stop it a few times. And when we finally got it working, I didn't realize from starting and stopping, my microphone switched to my laptop microphone. So I sound like I'm in a Zoom meeting. Uh, you could still hear it. I adjusted the volume so everything was kind of level. He sounds fantastic. His side sounds great. My side just sounds like when you're talking to someone on a Zoom meeting. But just wanted to make mention of that to let you know why I sound that way. Otherwise, really fun conversation. So here's my interview starting right now. My name is Jeremiah Logeman, and I'm. People call me an artist. I've been <laughs> I've been okay with that for a while. It, it took a while, but now I'm okay with it. You don't have a particular style. You would say that it is. You do. I remember in high school art. I I got my art teacher put something my freshman year in the state capitol, and I thought, oh, I'm I'm awesome at art. And then the right. next art class, she gave me a horrible grade. And I'm like, wait, wait, this is just art. I can't get bad grades in art. And so like, and I kind of just stocked art for 20 years. That's all it took? It just took one bad grade and you're like, hell <laughs> with this. Bad grade. <laughs> I'm not, I was good out of it out of the gate and then I lost it. <laughs> I must have been impressionable. Anyway, so yeah. So when someone, when I was first referred to as an artist, I... I kind of like, I felt pretty self-conscious about that okay. um, because I mean, in so the beginning, my origin story is that um, I saw a, I saw JJ Watts defensive player of the year trophy, I think in probably, well, probably nine or 10 years ago. And behind this trophy, this picture that I saw was this beautiful American flag made out of barnwood. And I thought, wow, that's beautiful. And at the time I, I didn't have enough money to go buy i looked it up and i'm like oh it's a bunch of money i can't afford that well gosh that can't be too hard i'll make one okay. and so i made so it's actually this one here all right and and i i did what any anybody does they they make something they put it in their house they take a picture they put it on facebook and by morning i had orders for a dozen of these so and not only like i saw that ahead. in your bio and i'm like okay I need explanation on that because I'm like, all of us would love that. You know, I'd love to post something on the line <laughs> and then tomorrow have, have something like all of a sudden I have a bunch of orders. So literally it was just like you made this this piece and, and everybody wanted one or like friends and family, you know, I'm assuming, right? It's it's funny that when it was an accident, I got a bunch of orders. But now that I actually concentrate <laughs> on that part. That's what I'm getting like, at. Where are these orders at now? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I wanted to know. Okay, I was I, so it's like it's like the art project in the Capitol. It, it, the first one went really well, and now you got to work for it. <laughs> that's fair. That's that's a fair assumption. Right? No, I like that. Good, good. That makes that just that's that's more on my level. I'm, I I get that. If you were just like, and then now I make millions of dollars every day. <laughs> <laughs> An overnight sensation. Yeah. Yeah. So and it was it was even crazier than that. Um, I posted it. It was late. It was like, I don't know, 1030 at night. I went upstairs. I brushed my teeth. In the middle of brushing my teeth, a, a kid from college called me and said, hey, that thing that you made. I'm like, what? Like, <laughs> he goes, it's awesome. It, there's, I'm calling you because there's too many people that want one. And I said, I said, that was five minutes ago. He's like, I know. Yeah. I need one by this party I'm having in three weeks. Can you do it? And I'm like, what? So, I mean, that and, and that sounds spectacular. And I think a lot of people like, 
put a lot of effort into making something like that happen. And it was just, it was completely accidental. And like, I, through the years, I've tried to start businesses. I had some idea of making some kind of like action sports e-magazine thing and trying to sell apparel from that. And that didn't work. I didn't realize I needed a whole staff. Um, I tried making bacon flavored almonds and I put like, I put what? lots and lots of hours <laughs> into a company. Wait, it was, you went from a sports, <laughs> a sports e-magazine to bacon flavored almonds. How did that transition work? I, I have no idea how it transitioned. We were on a ski boat and we were talking about some stuff and, yeah. and I, whatever. And it was and my buddy's like, oh, that man's nuts. Or I said that, or he said that or whatever. And I'm like, well, that's going to be the name. That man's nuts from that, from that Dom DeLuise movie. Like when we were, I don't know, little tiny kids. Yeah. He's, he's chasing Burt Reynolds through the park. He's like, ah, oh, that man's nuts. Grab him. Oh, the one where they're in the insane asylum. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and I'm like, well, that's going to be a clicky name. That'll work. That'll sell some nuts. And so I had a name and I was working on this recipe and the recipe was fantastic. But the issue was that I, I could only make the nuts fantastic if I was actually using real bacon grease. Mm-hmm. And I had real bacon grease, but I wasn't, I somehow couldn't figure out how to source actual real bacon grease in a, in a, a food and drug approved method. Right. And so, and so I was trying to like recreate the recipe with bacon flavorings, industrial flavorings, and I just, it wasn't working out. It wasn't as good as the real one. And I, like, I, I put hundreds of hours into this and then, find, and it just didn't, it wasn't. I was trying to scrape the pennies and I hadn't even had a, per, a product yet. And I'm like, I don't think this is going to work. I don't think I can pay my mortgage. With this. Well, and did you even have a background in any sort of food? No. Uh, yeah. No. That, that's no. what I'm getting no. at. It's like you were, it's so I understand the creating the wood and also going like, I'm going to create an easing, but then to actually go into, I'm going to create some sort of food item is that's, that's a huge jump. And, and I don't want to, I mean, we don't need to focus too much on that because clearly you didn't do it, but still, I love the fact that, that you went in that direction. That's kind of interesting. My, my, the biggest blunder in that company starting off is that I was doing, I was going to this one tailgate for Badger games and every once in a while, um, the Woodman, Phil Woodman would show up at this party that I frequented and I'm like, Oh, that's my big success. I need to get Phil Woodman to, to eat my nuts and put them in his store. And, and I was like overzealous cause I was, I had the nuts, I was down tailgating and he was there and I, and I was just too excited and I grabbed him and I like almost like swung the guy around. I'm like, eat my nuts. And he looks at me, he's like, no. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> and, and that was into that. I'm like, Oh, I ruined that one. <laughs> oh man. We're not doing phrasing anymore. Come on. <laughs> That's funny. So, so what I, what I'm getting at is, is I have tried and failed and tried and failed and tried and failed at a ton of things yeah. that I had, like I had a plan, I had it written down, I had a good idea and nothing worked. And here this thing is, I just wanted it for my, for my room and made it myself. And magically I had 12 orders the next morning when I woke up and that's like, People see that and they're like, oh, that's what like makes their mouths water. It's like, oh, I want to be that guy. Uh And so like instantly first day success. But then you got to like, you actually have to produce the 12 and then you have to like grow from there. And you have to like, you do have to pay mortgage and put tires on your truck and things like that. Like it's just, it's not like a a one and done thing. You got to keep going. Yeah. So, so, so because that was the beginning all of a sudden they're like, Oh, the artist. Oh, he's the artist. And I'm like, Ooh, uh, like it just, it felt, it was intimidating to be called that when I wasn't really, sh- I was just, I was just like scraping money for the mortgage at the time. And I'm like, Oh, that's a, that's a hefty title. But I, over time, I, I started feeling comfortable with that. And when you said, what's like, what's your medium and that kind of thing, like, that's true for a long time. I just had my paddle up in the air and was letting the current take me where it was going to take me because it was working. I was paying the bills. Mm-hmm. And and then it, it actually gets a little trickier when you're like, all right, now I'm going to steer this ship in a direction. Yeah. And it's now, now it's, I'm going to like try to take it a certain way. And then things get more complicated with advertising spend or this market or that market or the next style or the next – product or things like that building up to that point like okay you had the people online like going okay you know 10 15 orders going like hey yeah but 
you, that's not necessarily like that's good. But then how did you keep that momentum? How did it keep building? And also, I wanted to ask one more thing first. Um, so you built the thing, which I love the fact that you're like, you saw that and you're like, well, I can't have that. I'll make my own. Like that's, that's classic, like high school style. Like that's the, you know, <laughs> you draw a poster cause you don't have one or whatever. And I love that. But did you have a background in woodworking at that point? No. Or? Okay. Nothing. Okay. So, but I mean, I looked at that flag and I'm like, well, it's flat. It's not structure. Like you can't, it can't be that hard. Like that's how I went right. through it. I'm like, well, that can't be that hard to make. And and there we are. So yeah, so I didn't have, I don't have an art background. I don't have a woodworking background. And then people also, oh, he's the artist. Oh, he's a great woodworker. I'm like, whoa, hold on. I'm like, I bought some nail guns, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I can aim them okay. Okay. So, yeah. And that's, but it just kind of grew. So, and then. And but how did that growth happen? Like that, that's what I'm saying. Like, so after those initial people, how did that actually happen? Like, how did well, you keep it what, going? got me a little worried because because i was going to run out of friends that wanted something out of wood sooner right. or later yeah right and then you got to find strangers and that's a different that's a different market or a different it's a different whole agenda especially um, if you've never done that before or finding ad, oh, you know people through yeah. advertising and stuff yeah. or promotion yeah but i mean if you need to buy groceries you come up with interesting ways <laughs> true <laughs> so i and and back to this like i also I was just knocking on farmers' doors, hoping that one of the barns in their yard that was falling down, he'd be like, yeah, go ahead, take some wood off of that. And so I had to knock on several farmers' doors. And when a stranger pulls up into a farmer's yard, they're like, who's this guy? Yeah, those right? are the places that have the no trespassing signs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so that was happening. And then, you know, over time it became – on a weekly basis, someone's like, oh, I drove past this barn and it's falling down. Here's the guy's number. I stopped in there. And so it became, I can't find this material to, oh, gosh, people are calling left and right. I got this barn. I got this barn. And I've taken down in the last, so I celebrate eight years here next, well, in August. Okay. And I've taken down seven. In my first three years, I took Four, three or four years, I took down seven barns. But you were just so taking was, these to your house, right? Like, where were you keeping all this wood, and how were you processing it to make it? It's it's kind of it's kind of a bizarre story because I, it just sort of happened. And I guess if we do want to take a tangent of yeah. bizarre stories, like one of the right when I was like running out of my twelve people that wanted the flag, yeah. I'm like, well, now what? I got to make a sales call, and I was living in Wanakee, and they were they were tearing down the lumber yard that was right down on Main Street, and they were putting in Lone Girl Brewery. And I found the guy's number, and it happened to be his cell phone number. And I left him a message. I said, "Hey, you're building a Wanakee business. I am a Wanakee artist. I have this this barn wood from a Wanakee barn. Can I make something for your restaurant?" Hmm. And and I left that message, and it didn't get answered for like two months. Okay. And then Kevin called me one morning, like I he had, like I just left the message like minutes ago. He's like, "Hey, got your call? Um, yeah, I'm I'm interested in a big table for this one part of my brewery. Can you make a table?" I've sat at that table. <laughs> What's, oh, have you? All right, <laughs> yeah, cool. I have. So, so here's the 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 lucky part of things is so I I'll cut out a lot of parts. Anyway, I got a a gear from Nord Gear, and it happened to be it was a one ton gear. By the time they pressed an axle on it and, and bearings and stuff, it weighed almost a ton. And we're inside of Nord Gear. My truck is inside the building. And all these engineer guys are standing around. And, and like, nothing's happening. I'm like, are you guys trying to figure out how to get in my truck? And he's like, oh, no, we're just going to get it in your truck with this, this fork truck thing. We're trying to figure out how to get it out of your truck. <laughs> and... And I said, oh, we'll, we'll figure that out when the time comes. And they looked, the, all of them turned and looked at me like, who's this moron? Right. Because when the time comes is like literally in 15 minutes and no one knows how to do it. So they like, they shrug their shoulders. They put it in my truck. If my truck was all the way down to the wheels, we drive it like the quarter mile and I pull in the parking lot and there's a crane truck sitting right there in the parking lot. I'm like, Hey guys, what are you up to? Oh, we're putting these AC units up on the roof of that brewery. I'm like, guess what else we're going to do? And so it's like all these like serendipitous things just like happened. Yeah. And now we, we got kind of the no one I'm noticing <laughs> table in this building. And then I'm like, oh, well, it'll, it'll magically happen. So, and anyway, so that yeah. was a tangent. What, 
what made me? Well, what did you first say of all, I want to talk about that table. Are you talking about the big round one that's in the corner of the front? Yeah, I've yeah. been there. So we've, I, I actually, this, it was on New Year's Eve. I was there for a wedding and we sat at that table and my wife and I were actually looking at it, like going, we were talking about the table and wondering about how it got made. I I can't remember all the specifics about it now, but I do remember that we did have a discussion about that table. So this is kind of interesting that I met you so did, now. Did you talk? Kevin into not having his giant New Year's Eve party for a wedding? Uh, it was, uh, we were upstairs. So oh, they, okay, they still had it. But we had okay. uh, we okay. had dinner beforehand before we went up there, so they were still setting up. But okay. no, they had the they had the New Year's Eve party. So to answer all the, the questions that you just said with <laughs> that you were having your wife, so yeah. those beams from that table came from right up the road. Okay. Um, it used to be the Dan County dump. Oh, and okay. right next door is... Um, is the Dan County shooting range up on highway 19. Mm-hmm. And that was a white barn. And I used to drive past it all the time. And the white boards were flopping in the wind. Mm-hmm. And, and when I, when I made that flag, I just drove up there at night, shut my truck lights off. And it would like get boards <laughs> off the ground that blew off in windstorms and put them in my truck. And it was working just fine. Cause the, it was up there. No one cared. And I was just coming and getting stuff that fell off. And then one day I drove by and there's a giant backhoe and some dump trucks. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's going to disappear tomorrow. Right. And so I, I drove up in there. I'm like, I, I, there was just some Dan County Parks guy or something. And I'm like, hey, uh, what are you guys doing with that? And he's like, oh, well, we couldn't find anybody to, to reclaim this lumber. We wanted to recycle it, reuse it, blah, blah, blah. But we couldn't find anybody. And I'm like, uh, yeah, I'll take all of it. Right. And he's like, all right, well, you, you got three days. And so I'm like, boy. So I took a chainsaw up there, tied myself in, cut all those beams out. I took all the, the siding boards off. I cut all the beams out. I put them in an old pickup truck that I had. And, and so the table you sat in wondering about it is yeah. just, I just drove in there one day and they're, they're going to take it down. I'm like, wait, 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 give me three days. And so that's, so that's the table. Huh. And then, so, so I'm making the table and Kevin calls me back and he's like, Hey, um, we can't find a chandelier either. What do you think about making a chandelier? Oh, you did the chandelier like, as well. I'm like, yeah, cool. Like, I know nothing about lights, but yeah, I'll make one. Okay. And so, so the if you sit at the table, the big hole in the center that's cut out is actually the hole is the wood in the center of that. Oh. That chandelier, and then, gosh, I at one point. I had found an antique hay bale elevator, like the square ones with the that get the hay bales up into okay. the hay mound. Yeah. And I I don't even know why I had this, but I had a <laughs> maybe it was for the chandelier. I don't know what it was. But I had all the chain from this antique elevator and that's so there's I think there's nineteen pendants that hang down at various levels. Yeah. And that's all antique hay bale elevator chain. Okay. That I welded up to a hoop. And I sat and wired 26 lights into that. And the electrician's like, hey, I'm not installing that. And I'm like, well, I'm not. Because, like, that's that's against his licensure or whatever. Yeah. And and I told that to Kevin. And I'm like, hey, so uh, your electrician's not going to wire it in. And, and he's like, just put a plug on it. I'll, I'll plug it into the wall. I'm like, okay. All right. Yeah. So, and so this is, here's a story about entrepreneurship and working hard and doing things that are a little out of the box. So he's like, so his answer to me was, we'll put a plug in it. I'll plug it into the wall. Mm -hmm. And so no one has a problem with this. Then. So the interesting thing is that room that it's in is two and a half stories tall. Yeah. And it's also, it's also a pretty tiny room for being that tall. And so I'm in there installing this thing, like a whole story above where it goes. And, and now it's time to plug it in. And mm-hmm. I brought a an articulating ladder that folds up like a map. Okay. And it, because you can't you can't bring a twenty some foot ladder in there because you can't even it'd be like right yeah um, you'd have to maneuver that around British that guy place, driving yeah. his car through the little <laughs> hallway right. right so so I get this ladder that folds out like this and I get it up and I bring my rock climbing gear and Kevin hikes up this ladder kicks himself off the wall into the middle of it grabs it plugs it in and i'm like this and i I yell up i'm like you're crazy yeah and he looks down he goes i wish i could tell you this is the dumbest thing i've ever done 
Right. And I'm like, I love this guy. He's awesome. <laughs> And we've been friends ever since. Like that was it was kind of experience. He was kind of like going out on a limb because I was a no name. I was a nobody. Yeah. And yeah, at this point, you had only just approached him and said, "I want to build <laughs> build something." For it was Mark. a blind message to his cell phone. That's all it was. Yeah. Okay. And then, so when you had the wedding upstairs, all that siding and all the headers across the windows, that's all my stuff too. Nice. So so this led to this one call led to several more jobs. They just kept building. And their okay. maitre d' table for a while was me, and their their, I I, I've done several things in there as my stuff, and the, but that was so that was, that was not part of my scope of hey what am, what do I do well even, because I was just even up to this point you had said that you weren't really like your background wasn't really woodworking so I mean were you watching YouTube videos like how were you learning this process uh, it, while you were doing this. I, I'm like, if I couldn't, if I didn't like make sense, I'd ask someone, I'm like, well, what do we do here? Okay. And at the time, because I just had a condo in Wanaki, I didn't own any tools. I didn't have any like funding money to start a business. It was just like, it came out of nowhere. And so a friend of mine happened to own a five car garage down on Wabisa. So kind of near East side. Okay. And, and I said, Hey, I need to make these flags. This and that. He's like, Oh, you can use my shot. Well, he said, go ahead, use my shop. Never thinking, oh, this guy's going to start a business in my garage. <laughs> um, but he happened to be an engineer, and he's very smart at structural stuff, mechanical stuff, all the wiring stuff. And he's just – I'm really glad that my first three years in business, I had him in the in the house next door to the shop to yeah. be like, hey, what do I do here? How do I make this part? What tool, <laughs> what's this tool do? So, like – and that was – very helpful. And I, I would have never been able to do this if it wasn't for just friends being like, oh, yeah, here's my shop. Here's my tools. Have fun. And so that was that was a major reason why this happened to be a success. And here I am eight years later. That story that you just told right there, if this were a movie, that would just be a montage where like, <laughs> then occasionally you, you'd be sitting there and there'd be music playing and you're like cutting stuff and looking at wood. And then suddenly you'd be like, hey, how do I do this? And then all of a sudden, both of you are cutting, and, and then boom, now you have a giant table. Yeah, that's I picked I like while it. you were telling it. I was picturing that. It's one of maybe those thirty-eight things. special. <laughs> you don't hear thirty-eight special reference very often. Nice. Um, <laughs> okay, so you did this. You were putting stuff in there, and I'm assuming that also helped with getting uh, more. I mean, that's like built-in advertising. Like this, this owner is just like people would be like, "How'd you get this table?" Or how did you get this? And they go, oh, this guy did it. So did people start calling you or did you actually start promoting and advertising? Well, if you want to hear another story that's just as silly. Sure. Um, the <laughs> reason why, why I stop went now. There, <laughs> yeah, right? We've got another 40 minutes of silliness. <laughs> um, so back up to college, right after college, um, I wrestled at Platteville and it was one of my teammates – um, weddings and it was the bachelor party and we're all young kids and we party all night and I passed out on this dude's shoulder in the school bus at three in the morning and now fast forward 12 years the guy I passed out on his shoulder happens to be the older brother of my teammate who also happens to be an architect in town who also happens to be running these projects of these you know two million dollar projects all over town handy and and so we we became friends on Facebook and he saw me taking down the barns and and he was doing the project of state line distillery okay it's a block behind batch bakehouse a bit ba yeah batch bakehouse okay yeah on Willie um, and he was doing that project and that project was an old track no it wasn't track building it was just a really old steel industrial building it should have been torn down. But in the the vibe of restoring what's old and reusing things, the owner of the distillery is like, no, we're gonna keep this building. We're gonna we're gonna work with what we got. And so there's a lot of rehab. And so in the architect's mind is here we have this old nasty steel building, mm -hmm. and we need to warm it up enough for people to want to sit here and drink booze for several hours. Yeah. And so he saw I was taking down barns on Facebook because we're friends, and he called me up and. He's he goes, um, hey, maybe some of the wood that you've reclaimed from these barns, 
we could use in this project to kind of warm warm up the space. And um, and then coincidentally, he had made a meeting for the owner and him and me to meet and look at the material. And then he changed the meeting time, and and so the owner came early because he 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 was there at the old meeting time, and I happened to be there trying to make things look like I know what I'm doing. And so we had a half hour to ourselves, just the owner of the State Line Distillery and me, and just small talk. I'm like, well, where are you from? And he said, well, I, I grew up in St. Paul. And I happened to have my hand resting on a giant pile of manufactured barn rafters from 1947. And the stamp, the manufacturer stamp on all these rafters said St. Paul. Oh. Uh, and I'm like, oh, all these are from St. Paul. And he started looking at it. And there's a bunch of oak. And when you distill whiskey, oak is a major part of what makes whiskey whiskey. Mm-hmm. And and he just, like, in that half hour of just him and me, he's like, can you make the bar out of this? I'm like, <laughs> sure. And he's like, can you do the walls? I'm like, sure. And he's like, what about this? What about this? I'm like, yeah, yeah all of it. And so it's like, I didn't know. If I could, I mean, I'm like, whatever, I'll figure it out. I just uh-huh. said yes to everything. And then we started drawing on napkins, just the owner and me. And wow. we, and so if you go to this tasting room at State Line, yeah, that's just the owner and me with napkins and a pen and the, and the one barn that I had taken down into forest. And he's like, well, what would, what could you use for this? I'm like, well, I got this wood. And he's like, oh, that would look good. And, and, and we, he showed me some pictures of some stuff that he'd seen in Europe that he liked. And, and that's what the, the bar face is, is this thing that he had seen 20 years ago at some place he liked drinking at when he was, he, he left his job and he went and got a, a master's in distilling and brewing in Scotland, I think. Okay. And, and so during his, his schooling, he saw this place, he liked it. He went there a lot and he kind of want to bring a piece of that home with him. He's like, Hey, this, can you, re- can you kind of replicate this? Kind of make it your, yours and mine. I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Okay. And so, so that was the, the weird transition was just this guy that I met at a bachelor party when I was 22. <laughs> that little crew of people down, downtown kind of, kind of running in a tighter circle. And I just, I ran into him somehow. And, and then I did the tinsmith stuff. Okay. And I don't know. There's some people that do a little moving and shaking that say, oh, this Jeremiah guy, he reclaims stuff. He could probably make this look neat. And they call me. The lesson learned is basically the one thing not to do is to walk up to a person and grab them and say, taste my nuts. Taste my nuts. Because <laughs> no. that's the only that's the only non-successful story so far. <laughs> yeah, I think you've got it. <laughs> the how, so when you did when you do a project like this, like how just out of curiosity, typically how long does it take you? To, to oh, because I don't know what I'm doing. It takes way longer than it should. <laughs> yeah, way way longer. But on average, if you had, if you had to guesstimate, like does it take a, 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 like a year, two years? Like how how long does something like that? Take? Well, I so with. I have a table in my shop right now that has taken me two years only because there was never like a, a due date, okay. but with commercial jobs, like that guy wants to open his business yeah. and there's like a, there's That's why a I ask, Cause that takes a while. Yeah. So with me just being a one person operation, I have the deadline. So if it takes me a million hours, I got to cram those million hours into a start date. Mm-hmm. And so I just need, maybe I need to work 4,000 hours a week. To, to, to be part of the plan and then I just do that and then I'm a lunatic for a while and uh-huh. but it all works out that's a short trip from now to okay. lunacy well and so during this time too you're also still making the stuff like the flags and your own uh, personal like art items uh, so how does that factor in how are you promoting those and getting those put out there like th- those are the things where it's like you can bring money in every day while you work on the big project so you yes you're a you're a good thinker when it comes to all that stuff. So yes. So back in the infancy, five years ago or so, I was making one thing, selling one thing, making one thing, selling one thing. I'm like, well, cool. I'm glad I can pay the bills, but I'm never going to get anywhere doing this. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I thought, well, maybe I'll make something that I can make one time and then sell it a thousand times. So I made a t-shirt. I'm like, all right, what's easy? A t-shirt. So I, and the first t-shirt was just kind of like the vernacular of what Wisconsin people say versus people from other states. And right. I just, I, we're coming back to Facebook a lot, but I just, I put out there on Facebook. I'm like, Hey, 
what one word do you hear or say that is like totally a Wisconsin word? Then I took my the 50, 60 answers from my friends or whatever of the most Wisconsin-y things in their vocabulary. And I made a state of Wisconsin shaped t-shirt of those words. Okay. And it, it had moderate success. I've sold a few hundred of them. And, but the goal was, Hey, while I'm sitting here doing woodworking in my shop, is there something that can keep, keep just generating like a passive sort of income? And so the t-shirt, it was, was sort of that. And I'm like, all right. And then, I can't take credit for any of this stuff. So I did the, I did the word one and then I wore it someplace and a lady looked at it and she goes, you should do that with supper clubs. And I'm like, well, that's a fantastic idea. Oh, so I did another map of the state out of just famous supper clubs. Okay. And that one sold way better than the first t-shirt of just the words. And then from the t-shirt, then someone said, well, maybe you should make an old fashioned glass with that same logo on it. So I, so now I'm cutting teeth on who print, how do you print a glass? How do you get a glass? How do you, whatever, all this stuff. And Answer made, that for me though. I, how, how did you do that? Cause that's, while you're saying, how do I do this? It's like, yeah, how do you do that? So I know there are print on demand things, but you can't do like quality check or like find like, and you don't know what kind of glass you're getting. So how did you find a, a way to do, was this print on demand? Was it local? In a previous life, I built a house for the guy that owns all the um, Pasquels. Oh, yeah. At one point, I had built one of his homes. And so I knew him. I knew he was in the restaurant business. And then his wife, for a little bit, worked at a store called Nina, a women's fa- fashion store in Middleton. And so, and I was friends with the owner of that place. I called her. I said, hey, what's Christie's? How do I get a hold of Christie? Because I'm trying to get a hold of Ben. And I got his number. And he, he was really nice. He gave me of of info on how he gets his glasses for his, his restaurants. Oh, okay. And so I just called. So it was a kitchen supplier out of Milwaukee who also owns a printing facility, and they print their own glasses. And I called them, and I bought a couple hundred of them, and they did them, and they showed up. And so, so now I have one T-shirt, two T-shirts, and now I have a glass. And I took the glasses someplace, and I met the women – that own grasshopper goods and they're like these grasses are these glasses are incredible and it was right next to to deb that owns wisconsin candle company she's like you should put candles in these glasses and so i, I was just gonna two- ask the candle question <laughs> that's so then i walked two doors down to wisconsin candle company and i'm like hey i'm so-and-so and so-and-so says you're cool and can you put your candles in my glasses and she's like that's a great idea so that was five years ago and last january her candle with my design on it mm-hmm. made Rolling Stone magazine. Oh, nice. I which didn't know I'm that. Like, people work their whole lives trying to get on Rolling Stone magazine. Yeah, and, you didn't even have and, to join a band. <laughs> right? Can't get, well, I keep getting richer, but I can't get my picture on the co- Oh, yeah, on the cover of the roll, dude. So. <laughs> wow, that's pretty cool. Nice. So it's... I don't know. It, these little things just sort of kept happening. Oh, you should do supper clubs. Oh, you should do glass. Oh, you should you should do a candle. So it's not like I'm some brainiac that was like, oh, this is going to be a t-shirt, a glass, a candle, a towel, a sticker. Okay. Like, I don't, I don't know. People just said, oh, you should try this. You should try this. And then I wore the supper club one to Drumwind Ridge and I met the owner and he's he looked at it and he asked me about it and he's like, oh, you should do wineries. I'm mm-hmm. like, that's a good idea. Okay. So the next one was a map of Wisconsin of wineries. And and are you drawing the crazy, these designs or how are you getting these designs made? So because I got that bad grade my sophomore year in high school, okay. like as a third grader, I thought I was a pretty good drawer. Okay. Turns out there's way better drawers. So I had a friend that I've had for a long time. She's an illustrator. She actually has an art degree. I called her on the supper club one. I called her. I said, hey, I've got an idea. Do you want to be the person that draws this? I went to the library. I checked out the two books by Ray Fayola. Is that the guy's name that does the, did the Supper Club movie on Wisconsin Public Television like 10, 12 years ago? Oh, I can't remember. I don't know. I think his name is Ray Fayola. Okay. And he's a he's a movie maker. And he did all the work to make the Supper Club documentary thing. And so he just took he just took all the info, made a coffee table book, and it was a wild success, the book was. And then a couple years later, he made 
the second edition of the book. So there's two really popular supper club books um, that are like, you know, it, it's a real gifty Wisconsin thing. Yeah. So I went to the library. I looked, I read those two books. I picked out, so there's 50 in each of these. I picked out, I'm like, well, how many names are going to fit on this t-shirt idea? And I kind of like picked out the coolest ones of the two books. And then I, so I took that map. I, I made a little, made a little map of Wisconsin and, and put all the, all the cities where they were. And then I gave my artist friend the map of where they were. And I'm like, all right, here's, here's the, there, there's, there's 56 supper clubs on that design. I said, here's the 56 supper clubs I'd like to use. Mm-hmm. And I, they're just kind of spread out. Can you fit them on here and make it look cool? Yeah. And it was fantastic. Is she, I mean, she did the most bang up job. Um, her name is Becca. Her company is called Cheekly Offbeat. She's a drawer. She's a painter. She's a, she's a refurber. She, like, she did fantastic work. Okay. Um, and that supper club image that she did was, it's like your favorite pair of blue jeans that you just hope you never grow out of because it fits so good. Yeah. And that's what it looks like. It's that classic denim. It just looks timeless. Okay. And it just worked. And so I had her do the, so that's hand drawn with pencil and paper. Right. Yeah. A year later, I'm like, Hey, let's do wineries. And she did the same thing. She pens. that's all pencil. So, and you started getting these, you started getting them made, and then uh, how did you start selling them online? How did you start setting up a store to actually do these online? The crazy thing with the winery one is, and this, so I think it's we're going on four years since I did that design, is I, and here it is, I'm not like this trained artist. I'm like, well, what would look good? What Should we try this? And what? So I picked, you know, it was wine, so I picked like a, a winey purple color. And then at the time, the trend was tone on tone. So I put a like a wine colored print on a purple shirt, mm-hmm. and it looked horrible. It really looked bad. Okay. And then I had that as a concept. And then someone says, "Well, what if there's guys that like wine? They're not going to wear a purple shirt, probably." So I then I did a like a heather gray with another with maybe in the same purpley ink, and that one looked horrible too. They okay. just they weren't good. They just didn't look good. And they didn't do well. I, it took forever to sell those. And I really, I, so the supper clubs, I went back to Kevin at Lone Girl and I'm like, Hey, so there's a brewery t-shirt out there that has your name on it. And it's weird because you're a brand new brewery and you're already on this guy's hoodie that I saw at some store. I said, did he, did he call you? Did he ask you if he could use your, your name? And he goes, no. I said, do you care? Kevin's like a, He's like a good business guy and he gets it. And he's like, no, I hope he sells billions of those. I hope he gets my name on billions of shirts and billions of people have them at their campsite or whatever. Yeah. Because he just gets it. And, and like the supper club people. And then I also call a lawyer. I'm like, Hey, here's my idea. Am I going to get pinched? Am I going to, if I use these 50 people's names of their businesses, is, am I going to get like sued? Cause I don't know. I don't know any of this stuff. And the lawyer said, well, the, because I could give you legal advice, but my gut reaction is if you've got 56 businesses, do it. You're just the, the law of averages is two people are going to have a problem with this. Mm-hmm. You just deal with those two people separately. Okay. You, you do, you, you do, you, you do the design you want, you push it out there. And if two people call you and they're upset, give them 500 bucks, give them some free stuff, say you're sorry, just. But to handle those two people separately. Okay. And so that's what I did with the supper club one. With the winery one, I thought it was a better idea because at a supper club, they want to sell you that steak. They want to sell you that that fish on Friday. They want to sell you the old fashioned, sell you a Miller Lite and get you out the door because they want to sell that table 10 times in a night. Yeah. And so it's like, it's like this. Yeah. But at the winery, you go there and you it's like a, it's like a day thing or a half day thing. You go there and you mingle and you, you drink a bunch of wine all day and you maybe have some crackers or whatever. And then you go to the gift shop because they all have gift shops. Mm-hmm. It's like, and, and the winery people are like, I don't know. They're like, I don't know. What do you call them? A little more well-to-do, a little more polished with a collar than the yeah. summer club folks. So I, I like, I treated the project differently. I called all of them. I formally invited them to be on the design. I made sure I had their approval to be on the design. 
Okay. I then had them send me the logo that they wanted on the design. So I spent tons more effort. And then I didn't see the success. I didn't see like a right. bunch of sales. And I kind of like got kind of upset that that one didn't fit. It was like the first thing that failed in my four or five years. This I had a big failure. And I'm like, oh, and I, I moved on, but I almost like just canned that, that design. And then the lady that prints my t-shirts, which is screen door printing on Willie Street, she's okay. fantastic. Yeah. She prints everything that I do. And she, I told her, I'm like, hey, this winery one just didn't, it didn't go. And she's like, well, why don't you just change the color of the shirt? And we picked this. Oh, soft, you were still on the purple one at this time. Okay. It was purple and it was gray and it was bitter bad. And she's like, well, here, try this, try this color. And it was a deep heather teal. It's this really pretty, sort of deep, sort of soft, aqua color. Mm-hmm. And we printed white on that and boom, it popped. It looked good. And instantly it was selling like, oh, it was selling like crazy. Okay. And so that went from my worst selling design to my best selling design in literally months. And now Drumlin Ridge up here on the north side of Madison, he sells tons of that hoodie, tons of that t-shirt. But it's, you're saying you sold them locally. You weren't really selling them online. I work, I started working on my website in the fall of the same year that the winery design came out. Okay. So my website's been out maybe three, maybe we're pushing, maybe it'll be four years this fall. Okay. That's actually, that's actually a a good long time. It's probably been out there longer than a lot of other people I know that have created their online stores. And and it's in internet years, like three years on the internet is actually a lot. Like a lot has happened on the internet in the past three years. That's fair. Yeah, Yeah. I hear you there. Yeah. And it, well, and, and it's funny because at one point, was it last summer, two summers ago, I really wanted to like up the ante on on my exposure online. And I read a book called A Million Followers in a Month or something like that. Okay. And I read it and I took a bunch of notes and I'm like, I'm going to own the internet. <laughs> and then, so I read that like in the summer. And then that fall, I met with a, a guy who, who does Facebook advertising campaigns. And I said, yeah, I read this book and we're going to do this and this and this and this and this. And he goes, it's like, that's like old news. Right. We, yeah. we don't do any of that stuff. Yeah. I'm like, I just read this. Like, get all fired up. So I don't, when you say internet years, it makes me think of that. So I don't know. Oh, yeah. That's Is exactly that like, what I meant. Yeah. Like even the advertising that he was probably talking about then is not viable. Like right now, Facebook advertising is not as lucrative as it used to be, or at least yeah. it's more difficult to navigate. Not that it sucks. It's still one of the easiest platforms to use, but it's even something you would have read a year ago doesn't apply anymore. Do you put your stuff on any other stores or is it just the store that you have on your website? Like, do you sell on <clears throat> eBay or anything like okay. that? Okay. So, um, if, if, if you have a lot of, a lot of correspondence between the people that are watching this and the other makers that you've talked to and things like that and your knowledge as well is the advertising spend and websites in particular um because i met with i was snowboarding and i'm on this chairlift with a guy and he says oh i manage google ad campaigns i'm like oh that's one thing i need i need to figure out Uh and he did a little analysis on my website and he said um well you have a I have a Squarespace site. Mm-hmm. And he said, well, Squarespace typically runs a little slower mm-hmm. than Google wants. And he gave me some pointers, blah, 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 blah. But I've had another few people recently tell me that Shopify is where, is where it's at versus Squarespace, things like that. Like, do you... It's like, built faster. What? Shopify was literally built to run faster. It actually runs on a... so. Not to get into it, but just it runs on a language that's called Liquid is what the code language is. And that language is actually built to run before. So most sites, when you go to it, the site is built as you're looking at it. Uh, Liquid actually generates the page as kind of an interactive, basic HTML page. So it runs a lot faster. All the stuff is pre-done on the server. Um, So the Shopify is literally built to run faster. Uh, Squarespace is built to be ease of use and it's all built inside of the same platform you use to edit it. So it uh, has a lot of heavy lifting that it does to make it 
easier to use, whereas that right. also slows it down. And sadly, and the one that I use, but I use it mainly for inventory, not my main store page, um, Square, which is the app that you can take credit cards with on your phone, they give you a free website, but they bought uh, Wix. No, they bought Weebly, um, and that they, they build a site for you too. But Weebly is even worse than, <laughs> than Squarespace as far as load times. Like, it is possibly the slowest cart that I've ever used. Oh, yeah. But uh, yes, that is true about uh, Squarespace. If you have, like, one or two things, perfectly fine. If you have a bunch of stuff, that's a lot for it to load. And my suggestion would be, and maybe this guy told you that too, pick an item that you want to promote, create a landing page for it that's separate, like say with the mail server that you use or the email list that you use, a lot of them, like MailChimp even, uh, lets you build a landing page. And you can just have that be, you advertise like, hey, this flag that I make, you know, get this for this much and like run an offer for it and sign up for my email list. And you sell it there, or you at least send people to that page and go click here to go buy it. And then it goes to your store. So, and that's just a way to advertise. It's not a way to build up your store as far as Google ad campaigns, but it's a way to uh, have your stuff show up as a, hey, buy this sort of thing. Like this would interest you rather than navigate through my site and pick something. You can just go buy this or look at my other stuff. Um, okay. That's just a suggestion. I used to work at an advertising agency and that would be one of the things we would pitch is basically what I'm getting at. And that's okay. probably what I'm assuming the other person said. And that's a way to solve the slow loading site because you send them to a really quick page that all it has is a picture of the thing you want to sell, maybe a little information, and then click here to go buy. And then it sends you to the cart. And that's So big thing is if I've spent thousands and thousands of hours on my website, yeah. is there a plug and play to just go from Squarespace to Shopify? Or do I have to redo the thousands of hours? I Well... Design-wise, you would have to redo. The information you put into it, I want to say, I, actually, I would be surprised if there isn't a service that goes transfer all your information to from Squarespace or, yeah, from Squarespace to Shopify. I would be surprised if there isn't an automated service to do that. But right. you would have to redesign it, but you can just pick a, a Shopify template. And I sure. believe that the pricing is pretty much the same for both services. Right. They're not they're not that far off. So to answer your question is I jumped on fair.com oh. a little more than a year ago. Okay. And they take a big chunk. Yeah. I'm, I'm not going to lie. If your margins are good, that chunk is worth being in a whole new store mm -hmm. and making four more thousand dollars in the calendar year. When, when you talk about growing and exposure and things like that, um, I'm in 30 or 40 new stores in the last year that I wouldn't have been in without fair.com. Nice. Okay. And they're, they're quick. They're quick to help you. They're set up to work really easy. And I, I don't have a whole lot of negative things to say about, what I've experienced from fair.com to get my stuff out to people that haven't seen me. And the reason why um, it's sometimes tricky is so my example is there's a cute little store in Middleton called the Regal find mm -hmm. cute little gifts. Jessica is fantastic. Oh yeah. I love Jessica. And, and everyone in Middleton knows that they want a unique gift to go there. Mm -hmm. But pre pandemic, she didn't, she didn't have a web presence, blah, blah. After you get out of that three-mile radius or the five-mile radius of people that know Jessica, like, for instance, the Internet, the Internet has no idea what the Regal Find is or how great it is. Mm -hmm. So for me, because I have a fantastic relationship with Jessica at Regal Find, because I walked into her physical store and we physically met, and it's great, I can't go find another Jessica in De Pere or another Jessica in Appleton or another Jessica in Eau Claire or, you know, like that. Like, so when I go search, because I was trying to do it with, with the winery thing, is I'm like, all right, we're going to expand this. And I was like trying to Google a little cool gift shop in whatever town, whatever town was nearest to the, where the vineyard was, I was going to market to that local gift shop. Right. And it was showing me like the 1-800 flower store. So... Fair.com has helped me in that because Google couldn't help me with that because these cute little shops 
they don't have a big web presence because everyone in town goes there. Right. I couldn't go find another replicate replication of her in another town. Yeah. Uh, it, it made it hard to find to replicate like like that's the eighty twenty rule, right? You want to find what your meat and potatoes is and then replicate that mm-hmm. and cut out the twenty percent of time wasted. So I want to go find thirty more Jessicas, and I couldn't. But Fair dot com has brought thirty more Jessicas to me. So that's working for me. Um, the part in my business that is still that I haven't gotten is that direct sale. And maybe it's because I'm on Squarespace or something else, but I'm so last year, my wholesale shot through the roof, but the margins really low, especially with fair. Cause they're going to take 25% the first sale mm-hmm. and 15% each time, each sale after that for that customer. And so my wholesale really grew, but the amount of money in my pocket didn't grow like the, the same way. So okay. I'm like, all right, in 2022, I want to grow my re- direct to retail like I grew my wholesale last year. With what you were just saying, do you have any events or things coming up where people could go check you out or at least, you know, just to let them know about uh, things that you have in the works that are coming up this summer? This summer well, year? I looked up Bonafest last night and I'm probably going to fill out that app later today. I also was in Monroe for Father's Day and I saw some stuff for Cheese Days. And I got a bunch of cheese stuff. And I'm like, huh, I wonder if, because I haven't been at Cheese Days since I was a high school. I'm like, I wonder if Cheese Days has like non-cheese vendors, non-beer vendors. Okay. So I emailed the people. I looked them up on the internet. And I'm like, hey, do you, this is hilarious. So I had no idea if they even had vendors. And maybe that's dumb that I don't know that. <laughs> but I emailed them. And I, I got a message back on a Sunday night, which is also kind of bonkers. Uh, and the lady goes, we'd love to have you. Chris Riley's wife was wearing your shirt just yesterday. Oh, I'm nice. Like, oh, that's fantastic. So I'm going to be at Cheese Days and I'm going to, I don't know. I remember that being a gigantic event. Yeah. And so I, I'm pretty excited about being at Cheese Days. Nice. If people wanted to check out these things that you've been talking about, where would you tell them that they, where would you suggest they go to see it? <laughs> FlagsOverWisconsin.com. I'm at Grasshopper, I'm at Regal Fine, I'm at Booth 121, I'm at Monona Terrace, I'm at the Kiss is it Kismet Books in Verona, I'm at Room of Their Own on Atwood. Um so yeah, I'm I'm all over town. I'm okay. just trying to get in the airport and I just they just won't sell my stuff at the airport. I'm like, you built this airport to sell stuff like this. <laughs> so anyway. Yeah, well I want to thank you so much for talking with me today and I'm glad that you reached out to be on the podcast. So yeah, this was fantastic.